In this video, we're going to be going over something that's near and dear to my heart, and I bet yours too, when you start talking about pay right, and what it is that human re resources is responsible for doing as far as setting up pay structures and handling all of uh, those aspects. Now, first of all, you have to make some decisions about pay as far as an organization is concerned. It can be something that's very strategic as far as what is it that you're doing to uh, attract, to recruit, to hire, and to keep people that uh, you need as far as their talent is concerned. There's going to be the stru job structure that's going to impact what the pay is, the pay structure, in other words, the policies and the strategies that you're using for that, and then also the various pay levels for the various jobs. Now, whenever, whenever you're thinking about your structure, you have to think about various things. First of all, you have all of your legal requirements. You have to make sure that you are following the laws as far as equal pay for equal work. You're hitting the minimum wage, paying at least that. You're providing overtime pay where it's responsible. And you have your restrictions on child labor. There's a lot of market forces that's actually impacting what it is that you can pay, uh, depending on where you're at. For example, if you're out on the West Coast someplace, you're going to be paying more for the same job than you would here in the Kansas City area. The reason is because the cost of living is much higher there. You also have to think about the organization's goals. What is it that is needed as far as the talent is concerned? What is it that you can do to actually bring in that talent that's necessary. You have your legal requirements. So in other words, you have to make sure that you're following the 63 uh, Equal Pay Act. In other words, you cannot have differences based on the various illegal areas of discrimination, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, veteran status, disability, that sort of thing. Now, one of the things that you may hear about are comparable worth, okay? There you have your equal pay, but then you hear about comparable worth. Comparable worth is basically a concept that says, okay, this job of like a, a secretary is the, has the same amount of worth to the organization as a truck driver, and there should be equal pay that goes along with that. There have been various... Um, proponents of comparable worth policies and laws here in the United States, but they have not been passed at this point in time. It's very difficult to say how much is this job worth compared to this job over here as far as the organization is concerned. So we still have that whole idea of equal pay for equal work. We do not have equal pay for comparable worth. So when you start thinking about comparable worth policies, they have not been passed at this point in time. It's too difficult to try to figure out what the various worth is. Other legal requirements, you start talking about minimum wage. That's the lowest amount that you can pay. You have the federal piece and then you, the state and the city may also include something uh, on top of that. Overtime. Anytime uh, someone who is hourly works over 40 hours, they have to be paid one and a half times the usual rate for any kind of overtime hours. Now, this does not apply to management. Management and people who are salaried, in other words, professionals, do not have to be paid overtime. They are expect they they get a salary. They are expected to do whatever is necessary for that salary. Not exempt are the ones who get overtime. Now, there are some companies that and organizations that to attract people to work really off hours might even pay twice as much. So for example, when I was working for a bank, um, if you were working second shift, you actually had a, on top of the over, if you went overtime, you had one and a half times, but if you went on top of that and you work in one of these really weird hour off shift things, you would get double as far as the overtime pay is concerned. You also have to think about child labor. Okay, people under 14 cannot be employed, but you know, you're going to have babysitters and things like that. Um, 14 to 15 can work only outside of school hours. And when I, I, I started working when I was 15 and where I was living outside of Philadelphia, uh, I could not work past midnight. I was working for a fast food joint and could not close. I couldn't work past midnight until I turned 16. Once I turned 16, then I could work past midnight and we closed and went until one or two o'clock in the morning. You also have to think about the prevailing wages from a federal 
standpoint for the federal contractors if you do any kind of work for the federal government uh, the pay has to be equal to the prevailing wages in the area one of the things that came about from the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Re uh, Reform Act was the idea of transparency as far as CEO pay and so one of the things that has to be reported uh, as far as pay is concerned is what is the ratio of CEO pay to the median employee not the lowest but the median employee influences on pay include the product in the labor markets in other words if you are working with a product that is uh, say you're, you're, it's a Walmart type thing okay you can pay less than an organization that may be making something that needs more skill as far as the jobs are concerned the other thing to think about is the labor market in other words where is it that you're actually drawing your labor from uh, for those various jobs you have to be able you're in competition with all the other companies around in your area and so you have to be able to compete with them as far as the pay is concerned to attract the people and the talent that you need in deciding what to pay what typically happens is you set up a range all right and in that range uh, you have a low and a high as far as uh, what's going to be paid for a job um, the market rate is going to be setting some things and you have to determine for your own organization do you want to pay market do you want to pay above or below market lots of companies report their pay for their jobs to various organizations okay like the Bureau of Labor Statistics and, and SHRM and things like this the whole idea behind this is so that you can people know how to uh, compete and what it is that they can do as far as paying their talent you have to come up with what's called a compensation philosophy in other words where is it that we want to pay do we want to pay at market or above or below and if you think about it market is at the 50th percentile in other words um, 50 percent of the people in the in the companies are going to pay more 50 percent are going to pay less once you determine your philosophy then you can start setting your rates now the thing is different companies will do different philosophies based on what they're trying to accomplish so for example when I was at Marion Labs our pay philosophy was we wanted to pay at the 90th percentile of premier pharmaceutical companies we didn't want to be the top payer but we wanted to be very competitive as far as pharmaceutical companies so you're talking about the Mercs and things like this and so we because we had to attract scientific talent and sales talent and things like that from around the country so we had we were competing against them and also for the hourly stuff we were competing within the Kansas City area so our philosophy was to pay above market to attract what it was uh, to attract the talent that we felt that we needed now employees are constantly judging their pay against others and what we do is we, we we're looking for fairness all right am I being paid the same amount as somebody else in another organization who's doing the same job if you feel you're not being paid fairly then what happens is you're gonna reduce your input you're gonna you're gonna back off to what you think is the fair level you might find ways to increase your outcome in other words uh, what can I do to, to, to make up for the pay that I'm not getting? Or you might decide to just leave the organization. Now, one of the things that we look for is the value of the jobs. And what happens is you get these compensable factors. There are various organizations uh, here in the United States and here in town where they will look at a particular job and they will help you determine as an organization basically how many points might be allocated for a particular job based on the amount of experience that the uh, job requires what kind of education the job requires how complex it is in other words what kind of mental capacity is going to be necessary or physical capacity what kind of working conditions poor working conditions are going to actually have more points to try to attract folks than somebody who's just in a, in a cushy type job and then how much responsibility is there the more experience education responsibility and things are necessary the more points that are allocated to a particular job 
And most companies will then at that point identify, here is the number of dollars per point so that the more points, the more dollars are allocated or going to be paid for that particular job. Key jobs are things that uh, would be things like senior managers and stuff like that. And what they do is they kind of identify here are the things that need to be set as far as levels of pay. So you can have some senior managers as far as like vice presidents. They are very key to the organization. Or you could have uh, very science, uh, scientists who are very key to the organization. What they do is they set help set what those pay structures are going to be. You then start determining how you're going to pay folks. Is it going to be an hourly wage? Is it going to be piecework? In other words, you do X number, you get this amount of money. Or is it going to be salary? And then you determine the pay rates. Again, based on the philosophy that you have, based on the uh, number of points that are going to be allocated to a particular job, you can then determine your pay rates. This gives you an idea as far as how many points along the bottom and then how much how much money along the side here might be allocated to those various jobs. You get your pay ranges, okay? So what happens is companies will set their minimums, maximums, and midpoints for a particular job. The way it works is something like this. Based on the number of job points, and there's a certain number of dollars allocated for each point. And so the more points, the more dollars you're going to get. Now what happens is companies will set a midpoint as far as the job is concerned and a range, typically anywhere from 80% to 120% of the midpoint. And so that's the amount that they're going to pay. If they're going to hire somebody into this job here, they are not going to pay them less than that 80% of the midpoint. And you could be in that job a long time, you're getting raises and things like that, and all of a sudden you hit that maximum you're not going to get any more merit increases. You get red, what they call redlined, okay? So you get redlined at this point and you can't get any more, you might get uh, cost of living increases, but you won't get merit increases. And so what happens is you have a particular job, it has a range, and what they try to do is they try to get you chasing that mid-range. So they might hire you in at this level here. You get a few uh, raises as, as you go along, a little bit larger. Once you hit that midpoint, the raises start getting a little bit smaller as far as percentage wise is concerned, because what happens is every year that midpoint changes a little bit. It goes up a little bit to adjust for the cost of living. The next job up might will have an overlap as far as the pay range is concerned. So and then the job after that. One of the things that companies do not want people to do is go from like a, this level here and skip a level and go up here. And the reason is because they might be in this level here as far as their pay range is concerned. And then all of a sudden they're having, getting, having to get a huge increase in order to get to here. So what they typically want to do as far as promotions and things like that is get people to go stepwise as far as the various levels are concerned. So this is typical of the way they set their job pay grades and the ranges that go along with it. Now, there may be other pay differentials. In other words, let's say that uh, when I was working for the bank, um, the pay differential for night shift, if you were working second shift, I think you got a 10% differential. So in other words, whatever the pay would have been for day shift, night shift, the second shift got 10% more. Third shift, which is what I worked, we got 25% more. So in order to attract people to work from 11 o'clock at night until 7 o'clock in the morning, they had to pay 25% more from the regular pay for a particular job. Now, some of the alternatives to job-based pay. One of the key is, there, there are a couple of keys. First of all, the de-layering. In other words, you're going from um, uh, multiple job levels. In other words, you might have scheduler one, scheduler two, scheduler three, uh, manager, this sort of thing. And what they're doing is they're reducing some of the layers. They'll just say scheduler. And what they do then, if we go up to here, they increase that range. So it goes, might go to 130 or 140% of the midpoint. The reason for that is because they're taking out some of these things here. 
when I was at pharmaceutical company, when I was at Marion Labs, that's one of the things that we did. We had very wide ranges as far as a job is concerned. And the reason is because we wanted people thinking in terms of a career. Another alternative to job-based pay is skill-based pay. In other words, one of the things that happens is you go through training, you build a particular skill, you get an increase as far as your, your hourly rate is concerned. Now, if someone is doing military duty, let's say that they are reserves and they're called up for a year or something along those lines. That happened to my son. He was, um, he was Navy for four years and then he went Army Reserve. And when he was in the Army Reserve, he got called up for a year to go to Iraq. His pay during that time for the company, when he went back, was adjusted to what he would have been making had he not been serving. Then you have pay for executives. Now, a lot of people think that executives, okay, like the senior vice presidents and the presidents and things like that are making all this money in cash. That's not true. On average, only about 12% of the money that they are paid is actually paid in salary. Another 22% on average are paid by bonuses. In other words, they hit uh, profit levels and things like that. A majority of the pay that executives get are primarily from stock and stock options. The whole idea behind it is if you have the president of the company and that president is working towards increasing the value of the organization where the stock actually goes up, you give them stock, they would then be motivated to try to increase the value of that stock. They want that stock to go up so that if they sell it, they've made money. So the whole idea behind this is, as far as uh, CEOs and senior managers are concerned, it's not just salary that they're being paid. A majority of their compensation comes from stock and stock options. So those are some of the key points as far as this chapter is concerned. If you have questions, please just give me a shout.